The next item of business is a debate on motion 14824 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on Scotland's economic future and economic data. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Gordon Lindhurst to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee. Up to 12 minutes please Mr Lindhurst. Uh, pardon my unparliamentary language, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I shall be talking statistics. It was Mark Twain who coined the phrase, I have known many terrible things in my life, nine-tenths of them never happened. At least that was in the version that I once read. He is also said to have said, facts are stubborn things, but statistics are pliable. The committee's biggest inquiries this year looked at economic performance and data. My aim is to provide a flavour of both pieces of work. And hopefully it is the facts that will shine through from the committee's work. Doubtless my colleagues will pick up on anything significant that I miss. Professor Graham Roy, director of the Fraser of Allender Institute, advised us on the data inquiry and found the experience so fulfilling he chose to return to the role for economic performance. The committee certainly benefited from his expertise, his rigor, and not to be underestimated in these matters, his patience. So let me start with statistics. The president of the Royal Statistical Society, David Spiegelhalter, has spoken of the Groucho principle. Groucho, my favorite Marx. Should you encounter a newsworthy number or retweeted stat, <laughs> Mr. Spiegelhalter advised, is Mr. Findlay wishing to take an intervention or is he um, al allowing me to refocus the chamber's Get, excuse attention Excuse me, can the two you remember speech? I'm still here and stop having a private <laughs> conversation? <laughs> Are you allowing the intervention, Mr. Lindhurst? Well, if he wishes to take one. Usually when Neil Finlay. I know when conveners speak, usually the clerks have a big input into their speeches, but we can be guaranteed they didn't write those ones. Um, Gordon Lindhurst. Actually, they did. <laughs> <laughs> but that is not to take away from the impact of the lines. <laughs> now, if I can return to what Mr. Spiegelhalter said, he has said, and I quote, uh, this may apply also to Mr. Findlay's intervention, if it's surprising or counterintuitive enough to have been drawn to my attention, it is probably wrong." End of quote. As a society, the extent of our data literacy is poor, and this may seem a niche subject, but it shapes decision-making in so many spheres. Public policy, corporate thinking, journalistic opinion, and public perception. The committee drew on the ethos of the Bean Review as a starting point for our inquiry. Professor Sir Charles Bean of the LSE led an independent review of UK economic statistics and published his final report in 2016. He encouraged a fundamental rethink of how we collect, present, and interpret data. In his words, and again I quote, we should not start with the statistic and then ask now, what questions can we throw at it? The key is to define the question carefully at the beginning. So the committee wanted to examine the accuracy, utility and comprehensibility of Scottish economic statistics. We took evidence from data producers, users, consumers and regulators. The report was detailed and at 90 pages, for uh, any of us, rather a doorstep or doorstop, we made 29 recommendations, most of them directed at the Scottish Government, others for the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the Office for National Statistics, and HMRC. The work was well received in the statistical community, and the Scottish Government accepted the main thrust of our findings. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? We have three matters outstanding. I begin with the least contentious. We sought a robust and independent analysis of Scotland's particular data needs, the aim being to distinguish the essential from the desirable and the useful from what we may be doing out of mere habit. 
Our recommendation was directed to the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board. Nora Senior, the board's chair, thought this might be better suited to the Scottish Economic Statistics Consultation Group. Um, that may be a helpful suggestion. And perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can tell us if it is doable. The second, and I would hope also non-contentious issue, concerns the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Its role in economic and fiscal forecasting is, as we know, crucial. And in the committee's view, its data needs ought to be prioritized for that reason. But from the evidence we heard, this was not necessarily the case. We recommended that the commission annually set out its data needs and that the areas it had already highlighted, including price and wages data, be prioritized. Accordingly, the Commission wrote to us in September with a first annual statement of its data needs, and it highlighted which organisations it relied on for such information and where improvements might be made. And again, I hope the Cabinet Secretary will respond positively to those requirements. The third area is contentious, at least it has been to the Scottish Government, but it needn't remain so. It contains, or concerns rather, pre-release access, or PRA. This is the practice of making statistics available to ministers and their advisors prior to publication. The Office for National Statistics ended pre-release last July. The Bank of England followed suit. We recommended the Scottish Government end pre-release for economic statistics of national importance, including GDP. This was the majority view of the committee. The minority opinion, though more circumspect, called for a presumption against pre-release. So how is this issue viewed by the statistical community? The Royal Statistical Society supports an end to pre-release. The UK Statistics Authority supports an end to pre-release. The Office for National Statistics supports an end to pre-release. The author of the Bean Review supports an end to pre-release. And the UK's National Statistician also supports an end to pre-release. In a letter to the UK Statistics Authority in June 2017, John Pullinger said, and I quote, on the basis of all the information now available to me, I consider that the public benefit likely to result from pre-release access is outweighed by the detriment to public trust. So 10 years ago, the UK Statistics Authority itself wrote to the Scottish Government to say, and again I quote, enabling the administration of the day to discuss and prepare statements whilst not allowing the same access to Parliament or the public is not, in our view, good statistical practice. And it added, we believe our view on this is shared by statistical offices and other authorities around the world. So, Presiding Officer, that was 10 years ago, 10 years in which the direction of travel has moved away from pre-release and toward the principles of equal access and earliest possible release. Ten years of the Scottish Government facing in the opposite direction. Now, the Cabinet Secretary's early comments to the committee were highly encouraging and his tone never less than positive. But so far, no actual delivery on pre-release access to follow UK best practice. So if he does not take action on this, the committee may need to initiate a bill to deal with this long-standing issue. I turn now to economic performance. Ronald Reagan once remarked, and I quote, and again, um, I can advise Mr. Finlay that this and these lines were drafted by committee clerks. While at the same time, I in no way seek to distance myself from them. Ronald Reagan once remarked, and I quote, economists are people who see something that works in practice and wonder if it would work in theory. End of quote. <laughs> we wanted to examine what has worked in practice since 2007, the year the National Performance Framework was launched, and to look forward, assessing the threats and opportunities of the coming decade, focusing on innovation, investment, 
internationalization and inclusive growth, as well as broad drivers for economic growth. We consulted extensively with a wide range of businesses, experts, including economists and households. We held eight focus groups, two each in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and indeed in Jedburgh. We held formal evidence sessions across 12 committee meetings. We met with the OECD and Skyscanner, among others. We heard incisive evidence of success where Scotland is leading in innovation. And while traditional industries had struggles, had struggles and indeed had struggled, other industries have flourished. It's been good for video games, life sciences, food and drink, and tourism. Not so good for oil and gas or construction. We sought a consistent definition of inclusive growth and a better focus on reducing the gap between the low performing and high performing regions. We also wanted more done to support women in business being able to access funding and advice and greater support with job transitions and reskilling throughout all of our working lives. It appeared that the committee's report had an immediate political impact, a change of cabinet secretary in the very week we published. Coincidence? Who am I to say? And I quote, from the new cabinet secretary, this is a complex area with interlinking -link themes and dependencies and I commend the committee for the thoroughness and breadth of its inquiry. The new cabinet secretary, new to us as a committee anyway. And again, we see in that the positive tone. But I want to explore the Scottish government's response to our findings in a number of areas as I come gradually to a close. NPF, Growth, Economic Strategy, Enterprise and Skills and Business to Business Learning. We had concerns about the ability to measure policy impact under the NPF. The Scottish Government referred to our data inquiry and specifically measures to judge progress toward inclusive growth, including prioritizing the data needs of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and renewing the impetus in developing the means of measuring social inclusion. We repeated a call from our gender pay gap inquiry to raise the status of the care sector in Scotland. The Scottish Government has said that an analysis of the growth sectors would be overseen by the Chief Economic Advisor, and this would include the care sector. We pushed for future updates of the economic strategy, uh, sorry, the economic strategy to be strengthened, accompanied by an implementation policy and supported by an evaluation plan. And the Scottish Government has accepted that recommendation. Now we recommended, amongst other things, more transparency with the performance targets set by the enterprise agencies. Uh, the Scottish Government has said that the strategic board is developing a framework, one that would be more consistent with the national performance framework and the economic strategy. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, we were pleased with the overall response, uh, but we think that calls for more than intentions and harmonious sentiment from the Scottish Government and look forward to progress in these areas in which the Scottish Government has accepted what we recommended. And to conclude in the words of our ever insightful advisor, Fraser Vallanders, Professor Roy, strategies and advisory groups are no substitute for good policy based on evidence, data and impact. I move the motion. Well, I now, <laughs> I now call Derek Mackay. Eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think, in fairness to Gordon Lindhurst, that was nearly as funny as the Chancellor's jokes from the budget uh, this year. But I have to say, far better than what the civil service write for me, <laughs> by way of, of, of humour. Um, I actually think this is a very helpful debate. And it is true to say there was a, a change of personnel at the, the point that the, uh, the committee's report was published. And I actually think it was very timely because as a cabinet secretary taking on responsibility for the economy, 
uh, was helpful, informative in my uh, thinking as I've tried to find the consensus on the economy. Of course, there was a subsequent change to personnel as well, just as I was trying to reach out to the economic expert that is Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey was then moved as spokesperson that I would have been dealing with. So I look forward to Jackie's intervention as well. And I welcome Richard Leonard in this particular position in relation to uh, the economy of Scotland. I would like to commend the committee for the, the thoroughness again in the breadth of its report uh, into Scotland's economic performance, because I do believe that across the chamber, we are actually all in agreement about Scotland's huge economic potential. And I know that the focus of the review was around statistics and data and performance. But looking at the report, I want to, to build on the recommendations, taking that consensual approach in the economy uh, that I have tried to establish over the course of the summer to agree with uh, most of the committee's findings. And I've certainly given that response uh, in writing. So much so I was able to take forward the economic action plan, not another strategy, but actions to deliver on the economy and it sets out the range of actions that we are taking forward to address the challenges and recommendations that are highlighted in the report to try and stimulate our economy even further. The action plan builds on the economic strategy that was in existence that focuses on increasing competitiveness and tackling inequality that go hand in hand. They're not separate ambitions. They support one another and we must consider them together. Now we have had some significant progress over the recent period. Unemployment rate sitting at 3.8%, its joint lowest rate. Yes, I will. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. He mentions the new economic action plan. Can he uh, explain why it doesn't contain any new economic targets going forward? Is it because the government missed all seven of its previous economic targets? Cabinet Secretary. I think as we've previously debated, a number of those targets have been affected by things like the financial crash, the oil and gas downturn, so on and so forth. We want to deliver those targets. I didn't set new targets because we want to get on with what we've been trying to achieve. It did, however, outline new actions that we should take to deliver on the economy. And we can argue about the targets. I want to deliver them, but the action plan was about the actions to deliver those targets. And again, on current performance, we do have near record low unemployment at this point in time. Surely that's to be welcomed, lower than the rest of the UK or on productivity. Growth under devolution has been faster. Uh, yes, I will. Joanne Lamond. Do you share my concern that the unemployment and employment figures mask huge numbers of precarious work with people in zero hours contracts with no guarantee of income with all the stress that involves? And would you look at ways of identifying that the scale of that problem within any statistics that you quote? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do share that concern. I do think we have to look at those issues. We have to look at issues of exploitation as well, underemployment, the skills gap. So of course there's a whole host of matters that lie beneath that figure, but surely it is to be welcomed nonetheless that employment is, uh, unemployment is going down and employment is going up, notwithstanding the challenges that we face coming from Brexit. But I actually you know, have agreed with the point that within that there's gender issues, there's poverty issues, there's skills issues that of course we need to explore. Uh, but we should, uh, at least for a moment, reflect on the falling unemployment uh, rate. It, Progress on productivity, progress on GDP as well, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. But again, recognising that that subdued GDP in terms of EU nations is subdued because of the Brexit position that the UK government has taken us to. But within that, despite the narrative that we've had from others, actually Scotland's outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom on GDP growth over the last 12 months. But inclusive growth uh, is important to return uh, to Joanne Lamont's point here that inclusive growth is about allowing more people to contribute to that economic growth and benefit from it. And another factor within those statistics is that uh, we're performing quite well on the real living wage. We want everyone to be paid at least the real living wage, but we're outperforming all other UK countries in terms of the payment of the real living wage wage, progress that we must uh, build upon. We know that we can achieve more. That's why we're investing in the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. It's one of the examples of how our investment is, is there to transform skills, productivity and innovation, commercialisation in Scotland. And on-site work is now underway and a full business case has been approved and detailed design work will start uh, this year. 
Now, with the approval of the first seven NMIS industry doctorate projects, industry is also starting to contribute to showing how the Institute's national reach and ability will help develop the skilled workforce, which will enable manufacturing companies to thrive in Scotland. Other commitments to ensure a highly skilled and productive workforce include the establishment of a, a national retraining partnership with trade unions and business, expanding uh, free childcare, the uh, uh, funds around attainment, giving every child an equal chance to succeed, more around apprenticeship opportunities, taking them to 30,000 per year by 2020, and ensuring that higher education remains free to all students in Scotland. But of course, businesses are essential to delivering that inclusive workforce environment in Scotland. That's why we're doing so much around productivity, performance, innovation, and on exports, identifying our growth opportunities, but with a key pillar of our Fair Work Action Plan as well, to ensure that we can become Fair Work Nation by 2025. We're continuing to work on the Scottish National Investment Bank to be a cornerstone institution in Scotland's economic landscape. That will be, of course, uh, underpinned by the legislation I'll introduce, hopefully, uh, to Parliament in 2019, backed up by investment of £2 billion over the 10 years. And from 2020, the bank will be investing in businesses and communities across Scotland. Of course, preface to that will be the Building a Scotland Fund. And a programme for government commitment to have a national infrastructure mission will mean that annual investment in our hospitals, schools, houses, transport, low carbon technology and digital connections will be around £1.5 billion higher by 2025 26 than in 2019-20. A new infrastructure commission will be established to provide that long-term strategic advice to the Scottish Government on national infrastructure priorities uh, with further details to follow. So our actions have placed us in a stronger position to face the challenges, uh, whilst as all members will reflect upon the decision by Michelin to close the Dundee plant is deeply unfortunate based on extremely challenging market conditions, but the company has agreed to consider a repurposing proposition and have brought together that action group led by Scottish Enterprise and Dundee City Council to develop a proposal with a clear aim of retaining a commercial manufacturing operation. So we can have plans, we can have the actions, but we must also be fleet of foot. Now, as we've already touched upon, Brexit is a significant challenge to our economy. That is why we need to get the least worst outcome. But in conclusion, eh, presiding officer, I recognise that this is a helpful report, one of many over the course of the summer, to help calibrate our systems to support economic growth. And I genuinely want to, as the relatively new economy secretary, help find the consensus that exists in the chamber to invest in our economy, to deliver fairness at the same time. And that's why I welcome eh, this afternoon's eh, debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Richard Leonard. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me start by thanking the clerks and advisors to the committee for their invaluable support uh, during the inquiry. Uh, commenting on the committee report on economic data, Gordon Lindhurst, convener, explained the concerns of the committee surrounding the Scottish Government's pre-access to economic data. The committee heard evidence that pre-release access is inconsistent with international best practice, with transparent government and democratic fairness. The reality is that pre-release gives the Scottish Government 24 or 48 hours to spin a positive story around key economic figures, no matter how bad they are. Meaning that as soon as the data is publicly available, the media headlines are already dominated by S&P spin. That's why the Director General of the UK Statistics Authority has called for the reduction and removal of pre-release access for the Scottish Government. I'll give way. Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask, should the same rule apply to Scottish, uh, UK government departments that you're suggesting should apply to Scottish government departments? Dean uh, We're simply uh, recommending the best practices followed, which is followed by the ONS and the Bank of England uh, in relation to sensitive economic data. So that's what the Scottish government should be doing as well. So we support uh, a change here. And as Gordon Lindhurst mentioned, we will keep open the option of a committee bill to address this issue if the Scottish government fails to adopt best practice. Presiding officer, turning now to the committee report on Scotland's economy, uh, one of the key conclusions reads as follows. Economic growth in Scotland for the past decade is below the performance of the UK economy and historical growth rates for Scotland. And levels of GDP growth are marginal, productivity is low and wages are stagnant. It doesn't have to be this way. Scotland's economy has strong potential. Long-term economic growth in Scotland was 2.3% 
before the SNP came to power in 2007, but this has fallen to just 0.7 under the SNP. So where has it all gone wrong? Perhaps the Minister is going to explain where it has gone wrong. I'll give you. I just wondered if the, if the member thought that Brexit was going to improve those stats or make them worse. Dean Lockhart. I think that remains to be seen over the medium and longer term. But the point is this report looked at the past decade and the significant underperformance of Scotland compared to pre-SNP as well as the rest of the UK. So in looking at where things have gone wrong, the committee heard evidence of serial policy failures over the past decade and fundamental flaws in the SNP's approach to the economy. Uh, let me help the Cabinet Secretary here because the list of failures is long, so let me briefly summarise what those uh, issues are. First of all, the committee heard evidence that the SNP's economic strategy itself, the 4i strategy, lacks focus and coherence. Nora Senior, Chair of the Strategic Board, told the committee the 4i economic policy is not joined up across ministerial departments and this causes confusion to the enterprise agencies. The SNP's strategy of inclusive growth is also causing confusion. The previous Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, told the committee that inclusive growth means different things to different people. In other words, there is no agreed definition of the SNP's flagship policy, and there is no guide to give the multitude of enterprise agencies responsible for delivering this policy. This evidence led the committee to strongly recommend that the Scottish Government's economic strategy be reviewed and updated as a matter of urgency. But here we are, five months after the report was published, and despite the new economic action plan, we are still saddled with an economic policy that is not fit for purpose. The committee also heard evidence that there is no framework in place to measure the impact of economic policy in Scotland. We spend over £2 billion a year in skills and enterprise, but the impact of this policy cannot be monitored because there is no framework in place. In fact, when the committee asked the previous Cabinet Secretary uh, for policies that may have worked or which could have been uh, put in place differently, he wasn't able to answer that question. Again, this led the committee to strongly recommend that a comprehensive monitoring and evaluation framework be introduced to measure the impact of policy. We understand the SNP's reluctance to set new economic targets, having failed to meet every one of the seven previous targets, but our view is that specific economic targets are essential if we are to properly measure the impact of policy. Another weakness identified by the committee was the inconsistent and weak implementation of economic policy. A clear example here is the fact that the enterprise agencies are allowed to set, monitor and measure their own targets without any real input from the government. I'll give way briefly. I thank Tell you for giving way. And a very serious question. I wonder if he thinks it would be appropriate to launch a new economic strategy with specific targets before we know what the future trading arrangements will be with the European Union, given the significant impact that could have. Dean Lockhart. Well, again, the committee looked at previous impact of policy over the past decade, but I think the member makes a fair point. We're not calling for a new economic policy right now. We were talking about a new direction, which I'll come on to later. So to address this issue of implementation and of policy, the committee called for more transparency on the performance targets set by the enterprise agencies, how these targets are measured and whether they have been achieved. A further barrier to economic growth is the confused and cluttered landscape created by the SNP which rather than supporting business growth is now acting as a barrier to business development. In fact, this parliament itself in a motion which was supported by the SNP acknowledged concerns that a cluttered policy landscape can lead to confusion, a lack of alignment, duplication and weakened accountability. That was a motion here agreed by all parties. The committee report also identified that we need to do more to support Scottish business to capitalise on the significant opportunities available in our single biggest market, uh, the UK, through the UK industrial strategy. In recent years, the, uh, the British Business Bank and Innovate UK have been involved in over £12 billion of investment across the UK. Much more should be done to help Scottish business access these opportunities. And the committee therefore recommended that more meaningful engagement should take place between the Scottish Government and the UK Government in relation to the UK industrial strategy. Uh, presiding officer, the committee heard evidence of many more uh, policy failures, but uh, I could list them, but I want to turn to a more general observation because every one of the policy problems, structural issues identified by the committee are within the control and power of the Scottish Government. These structural problems can be addressed through the introduction of a new coherent economic framework that capitalises on Scotland's economic strengths and our relationship with the rest of the UK. And the upcoming budget provides Derek Mackay with a real opportunity to address these issues. 
and to set out a new direction for economic policy in Scotland. And he can make a start by reversing the SNP's policy of making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK for skilled workers, for businesses and for our high streets. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Richard Leonard to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, I welcome this afternoon's debate, uh, particularly on this important report, Scotland's economic performance. And I want to begin by paying tribute to Jackie Bailey and Kezia Dugdale, who have done much to shape this report's conclusions, particularly the more radical ones. Let me be clear from the outset that there is much in the committee's report that the Scottish Labour Party welcomes. The recognition that employee and cooperative ownership has, and I quote, the huge potential to improve productivity, facilitate future growth, reduce inequality, and retain jobs in Scotland is welcome. Welcome too is the recognition that we need positive action to encourage female entrepreneurs who are underrepresented, not just in our corporate boardrooms, but in our startup businesses too. And the related long-standing challenge of scaling up businesses and the identification by the committee of the so-called missing middle in the Scottish economy because of an investment gap provides vital analysis. Because we know that all too often, businesses in Scotland are not scaled up, they are taken over. And the result is that a third of the Scottish economy is overseas owned. That's a level higher than all other parts of the UK, including London and the southeast of England. But there is a deeper-seated problem lying at the heart of the conclusions of this report, which, whilst we acknowledge, have their roots going back some considerable time, cannot overlook the fact that this government has been in office for over a decade and has time and time again been economically complacent and industrially inept. Ten years in, and with Brexit looming, it has failed to come up with an industrial strategy and it has failed to devise an economic strategy worthy of the name. And the result is that all too often, the SNP government is only reacting to businesses failing, rather than acting, planning and investing to ensure that businesses are successful in the first place. Yes. Thank Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I actually agree uh, with Richard Leonard that both Kezia Dugdale and Jackie Bailey contributed so much to this committee's report and in other areas. Can I then ask, why did they lose their jobs? Richard Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I'll treat that with the contempt it deserves. Indeed, in the Scottish Government's response to the committee's report, uh, for which I am assuming the Cabinet Secretary takes ownership and full responsibility, we are treated to a new phrase in the lexicon of SNP economic complacency. We are told that the takeover of Scottish companies sometimes hostile, is not a takeover at all. It is not even an acquisition or a merger. It is, and I quote, entrepreneurial recycling. Try telling that to the workers up and down the country who have lost their jobs, that they are not victims of a loss of local ownership and control or of a hostile takeover. They are simply being entrepreneurially recycled. Presiding officer, as the committee report shows, there is no real plan from the SNP for Scotland to face the future. There is no plan to not only tackle the challenges of automation, but to seize the opportunities of automation. Because the impact of the digital revolution is not confined to technology companies. It is being unfolded across all sectors, right across the economy. And that is why that is why Labour will continue to make the case for increased investment in education and the upskilling of workers. And it is why, as well, that the committee is right in this report to call for automation to be a cornerstone of the Scottish Government's labour market strategy. We hear much of fair work, but there are 470,000 people across Scotland still earning less than the living wage. And let me cite one real world example. And I dare, well, let me just give you this example. Let me cite a real world example. And I direct members to my register of interest. Just this week, self-employed drivers at DPD's depot in Cambuslang 
who've been getting organised with the support of their union have been threatened that their union, the GMB, will be sued, that their shifts will be axed or worse, that their livelihoods may be taken away altogether. This is intolerable. And I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to back my call for this company to meet with unions such as the GMB instead of threatening to sue them. Presiding officer, what we need is a government that is prepared to do more than simply correct market failure. We need one that is prepared to help to shape markets, to intervene, to use public procurement, to tackle climate change, to eradicate inequality and to change the balance of power to build a different, better economic future. On export growth too, we know that we've got a long-standing problem of too narrow an export base, so that just 70 businesses account for 50% of all of Scotland's exports. The committee makes the point in this report that the problem with our exports is not our trade strategy, but the level of investment going into it by the government. And finally, years after it was first announced, re-announced and re-announced again, it now looks like we might get a Scottish National Investment Bank. And it will go some way to helping Scottish businesses in need of investment. But I'm bound to say that the £200 million a year offered by the SNP is a long way short of Labour's offer of £2 billion of patient industrial investment capital a year in Scotland. And the Scottish Government says that the bank's board will determine what investment products to offer. Now, we do not underestimate the importance of market intelligence and expert advice. But who will be on the board making those decisions? Bankers or trade unionists and industrial representatives, women as well as men. So will the Cabinet Secretary agree, and let me finish on this note, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to a 50-50 gender balance on the board of the new investment bank? Because if we can insist, as we should, on gender balance in the political realm, why shouldn't we insist on it in the economic realm as well? Presiding officer, on this and other points, it's time for action. Thank you. I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Willie Rennie. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer, and uh, thanks to all the uh, people who gave evidence to these uh, two inquiries, to the clerks and to our special advisor, Graeme Roy. Uh, thanks, too, to the Labour Party for their keen interest in this afternoon's debate, although I see some people are less interested now. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the committee's report... <laughs> The uh, committee's report on the performance of the Scottish economy is not only, I think, a fair reflection of, I think, what has happened over the past decade, but also in connection with the uh, equally important data inquiry, a reminder that an assessment of economic performance is only as good as the data that underpins it, and that the data that underpins it is only of any utility if it's measuring the right metric in the first place. A good example of where we still have work to do uh, in this regard was highlighted in August this year when Scottish Government statisticians reported that they had adjusted the methodology of measuring activity in the construction sector. And this had quite an impact from the end of 2015 to the beginning of 2018. They had previously thought that economic growth had dropped by 12%, but in fact, it had grown by nearly 4%. Now, beyond the normative means of measuring the economy, members will be aware that Greens have substantial and fundamental concerns, questions and criticisms of how we define economic performance. We live in a world that's heating fast, with the trajectory and consequences starkly laid out by the IPCC a few weeks ago. We live in a world, too, where humans have destroyed 60% of the world's animal population since 1960. Our current economic model is destroying the very foundations upon which the health of the planet and the health of humans and other organisms depend. And the metrics, therefore, we use to assess our, the health of our economy are still focused on a model of growth that's blind to the contradictions at its heart that there are constraints and that there are limits posed by our environment. The well-publicised paper on hothouse earth, called Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene, which was published in August, observed that, and I quote, incremental linear changes are not enough to stabilise the earth system. Widespread, rapid and fundamental transformations will likely be required to reduce the risk of crossing the threshold. So green economics recognises that the climate crisis is leading to growing instability, unrest and economic decline. 
And Greens also recognise that in order to keep within the Paris climate targets, we need to keep in the ground the majority of the hydrocarbons that other parties in this chamber often tout as being part of Scotland's economic future. As far back as 2015, we commissioned the Jobs in Scotland's New Economy report, which found that investing in the transferable skills of the offshore uh, workforce who currently are employed in the oil and gas sector could create more than 200,000 jobs in renewables by 2035 against the 156,000 currently provided by fossil fuel extraction. And at a human level, the kind of economic performance discussed in these two reports ignores very worrying trends for households. Figures for private debt show that households in the United Kingdom owe nearly £1.6 trillion. Uh, this is forecast to rise to more than £2.3 trillion by 2022. And those levels of private borrowing and private debt are actually responsible for some of the better economic figures that are coming out of the UK. But that is a situation that's fundamentally unsustainable. Much of what passes for prosperity in this country is actually no more than a Ponzi scheme of rising house prices and increasingly unaffordable rents, which is driving the growing inequality in wealth across the UK. This will, and I'm sure members uh, are, will be aware of this, have substantial political consequences. As younger generations realize that they have a vote, there are choices to be made, and that their interests are not being well served by our current economic model. And I know members have heard Greens before on this topic, but I don't apologise for restating our opposition to GDP, a very poor indicator of a sustainable economy that fails to distinguish between useful economic activity and damaging economic uh, activity. The concept was happy to do so. Nigel Fraser. I'm grateful to Mr Whiteman for giving way. D does the Green Party accept in principle that economic growth is a good thing or not? Andy Whiteman. Economic growth. If one defines it by uh, growth in GDP, no, we don't accept that. We accept that the fundamentals of an economy are a healthy environment and human well-being. Now, the GDP was, in fact, invest, invented by a, an, a US uh, statistician called Simon Kuznets, and he was tasked by the US Congress in 1932 to estimate national income over the preceding four years, and responded by aggregating uh, several measures uh, uh, in regard to the value of goods and services, and today this is what we call uh, GDP. How, however, despite him, uh, Kuznets himself having conceived of the idea, he was actually one of its fiercest critics. It doesn't measure goods and services produced in the course of daily life, such as care and education. Murdo Fraser might uh, uh, be interested in that. It doesn't measure the distribution of income, doesn't say anything about wealth. It ignores environmental services, and it says nothing about energy flows. However, GDP persists and is the central goal of Scottish economic policy. The academic Kate Rayworth, amongst many other economics, economists, uh, have written substantially on this in her book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century e e Economist, highlights the growing recognition that what we measure is, is of little use if it doesn't meet the challenges that we face. And she recalls that classical economics, uh, arguments about land and labour and capital, which have actually substantially been forgotten about since the late 20th century in favour of arguments about labour and capital alone. But it's the natural resources of the planet, the water, the land, the soil and the atmosphere that sustain life on Earth. And if we have a serious debate on our economic future, we need to frame that debate with new economic thinking. Presiding officer, our debate about these committee reports should remind us that what we measure is as important as what those measurements tell us. And in 10 years' time, we'll be two years away from the deadline for taking action to contain global warming to 1.5 degrees. The economic consequences of not doing so are unprecedented. Uh, we have been warned. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call Willie Rennie to be followed by Angela Constance. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I have huge admiration uh, for the clerks who serve uh, our committees. Um, they, they, do, they provide uh, tremendous expertise and put a large number of hours into production um, of reports. And I can just imagine their joy when the committee decided that we're going to produce a report on statistics. The joy must have been flowing out of the room. And I can warn those in the gallery, it's not normally this exciting in the chamber on a Thursday afternoon. Um, but we ration the number of debates that we do have on statistics because Gordon Lindhurst can't contain himself when there is more than one a year. So what I do want to, however, focus on is that the performance of this government is stark. If you take the, the section of the Scotland's Economic Performance Report, 
that focuses on the 10 purpose targets. Only two of them, two out of 10, have been passed. Only two out of 10. We failed on GDP, on employment, on in life expectancy. There is only a small number, two that I can see, that we've actually passed. That, I think, is a mark of a government that's been in power for 10 years and hasn't taken the economy as seriously, I think, it should do. Yes, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I would uh, Willie Rennie think that the oil and gas downturn or the economic crash had any impact on any of those indicators at all? Willie Rennie. Of course it has, but what this does indicate is that we are stronger together as part of the United Kingdom to provide the economic breadth and support that we need during those difficult times. And that is why we should also not ignore that during the period, I mean, we're heading towards, what, 10 years of uncertainty through Brexit and through the independence uh, debates. And during that time, the amount of investment that's been disincentivised as a result of that constitutional uncertainty has had a direct impact on the economy as well. So he should not forget that because that is as much of an impact on the Scottish economy as anything. So the government have not performed particularly well over the last 10 years. Of course, there's been challenges, but those challenges um, should have been foreseen by this government who have been so dependent on a small number of industries and they should be looking to, to, to make it a broader economy, to make it a stronger economy. So if you look at the area, for instance, on uh, procurement, I can't remember the number of debates that we've had in this chamber about the inability of the Scottish Government to use the power, the economic power of its procurement budget to try and drive investment into small and medium-sized enterprises. But yet again, it comes up in this report about the failure of the government to try and invest in small and indigenous businesses. There are a number of experts and advisors who recommended ways forward on this, but the government were deaf to those complaints. The investment bank that we've heard about as well, numerous attempts by this government. I don't know how many announcements we've had that we're going to have this investment bank, and we've still not got it off the ground after 10 years in power. And of course, skills. Skills, I mean, the government didn't, and the minister didn't in his introduction, talk about the college cuts, the 150,000 places that have been cut from our colleges that's had a direct impact on the skills of our workforce that has fed right through to the performance of our economy. So the government has been too slow and too late on so many of the areas. And that is why eight out of 10 of those purpose targets have been failed by the government. I was interested in one aspect of the report, was about the missing middle, talking about the scaling up of Scottish businesses into larger companies that are anchored here. And I was interested actually in the proposals that it had in terms of anchoring businesses here for the longer term. And Dr. Mawson, I thought, made a particularly powerful comment about the public investment through Scottish Enterprise and other agencies was effectively, ultimately, lining the pockets of multinational companies. Pretty strong comment from one of the witnesses um, to the committee. But whether that's true or not, what we do need to look at is whether we can do more to anchor those companies here. And I was interested, like, um, like Richard Leonard and the proposals around employee ownership as one of the mechanisms to anchor those companies here. Um, um, certainly. John Mason. Making, but would he support or would he oppose the idea of making trains by a foreign company in Fife? Will you ready? Of course not. Um, but what we do need to recognise is whether we're actually going to get value for the money that we're investing in the companies. For instance, I would argue that the investments that we made into Amazon perhaps have not secured the return that we would have liked. So we need to look at the type of investment that we're making in these companies before we actually just bend over backwards to give them all the investment that they would like. Um, so employee ownership is one of the ways of securing uh, the companies here. We've obviously got the intellectual property that we've secured through the university sector. But skills are an important part of it as well, because a lot of companies come here because of the expertise that we have in our people. So we should constantly invest in people. But the final thing that I think is often overlooked, which is the, the stability, the general stability of our environment here, the fact that you can have companies that can operate here 
uh, with a secure environment around them is something that is attractive to many companies from across the world, which we should encourage too. In my final few seconds, I just want to highlight the issue of immigration, because the report does talk about Brexit. One of the biggest pieces of self-harm we're about to do is our approach to immigration. I have numerous industries in North East Fife, from the fruit and veg sector through the processing sector, the NHS, the universities, great universities in North East Fife, as well as the, the tourism industry. All of them are crying out for brilliant workers, and we're closing our doors to them as a result of the Brexit vote. We need to change that policy if we're not going to damage our economy further. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we turn now to our open debate, and I call Angela Constance to be followed by Jamie Halco johnson Angela Constance. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm a new member of the Energy, Economy and Fair Work Committee, and it is an interesting but somewhat uh, unique experience uh, for reasons I'm sure the uh, Chamber will understand. The committee report on Scotland's economic performance is, of course, timely as we are a, a decade on from the financial crash, the financial crash that unleashed great misery and untold harm, as invariably it is those with least who lose the most. And the crash will, of course, have its place uh, in history. And I have heard, uh, particularly in recent times, that in times of uncertainty that we tend to look more and hang on more to the past. And we should, of course, always listen to the lessons of the past. And it is a shame uh, that the West and our somewhat complacent financial establishment uh, paid no heed to the Japanese financial crash in 1997. Uh, otherwise, uh, history could have been somewhat different. But in terms of our experience closer to home, history will record that the powers that be for ideological motivations took full advantage uh, of the crisis to advance austerity. But I also hope that we, when we look back, will be able to trace the, the roots or the re-emergence of inclusive growth, more an economic philosophy than ideology, uh, to our time. And it is a powerful affirmation of hope for our future that growing our economy and tackling inequality in all its forms are not mutually exclusive, but they're two sides of the same coin. One feeds the other, tackling poverty, poor pay, health inequalities, widening educational opportunities, addressing the underrepresentation of women and others in key areas of our economy are all good for business. And similarly, if you want social democracy, you need to be able to pay for it. And the committee said rightly that our enterprise and skill agencies should have a common understanding of inclusive growth, but actually every part of the public sector should certainly have inclusive growth as part of their core purpose. And we need to build that consensus across uh, the private and third sectors too. And we need to create a consensus around what is the best dashboard of meaningful measurements that paints a vision of what a well-rounded society and a productive economy looks like. And the national performance framework is potentially important uh, in this regard. And the Economy Committee, uh, in my view, undertook a valuable inquiry into how to improve the, the, the coverage uh, and the relevance of economic data that also measures impact in a Scottish and devolved context. And I do note the differences of opinions uh, regarding pre-release access to official statistics. Uh, I can see the argument from both sides of the offence, uh, and for the time being anyway, uh, I'm just going to sit on that fence. Uh, because actually for me, the, the bigger prize is coming to a, a comprehensive shared assessment about the opportunities and indeed the challenges that are facing our economy today. And we should be able to simply say that as a rich, successful country, we are not uh, reaching our full potential. Our labour market does indeed remain resilient, but we must always scratch beneath the headlines because good employment figures mask insecure, low-paid work. And we must always widen her horizons, particularly when comparing our performance to others. It's not just about our nearest friends and neighbours in the rest of the UK, because sometimes their performance isn't good enough either, for example, with respect to productivity. And we also, despite political differences, need to identify common ground so that we can have the collective courage to take a long-term view and commit to the future. 
And I think we're beginning to see that with the uh, longer term investments in infrastructure, the Scottish National Investment Bank, uh, and crucially, uh, investment in housing. But we need to recognise that consensus builds confidence in our economy and our economic players. And with Brexit on the horizon, well, we certainly need to pull together uh, in Scotland's interest. The committee report helpfully listed where specific economic levers rest. It is important to understand where power always lies. But there is a need for a, a mature discussion and reflection about shared economic space and the potential impact of powers individually and collectively, given that we all know there is no one silver bullet uh, to a stronger and fairer economy. And looking to the future, we should never take our eye off the ball when it comes to our young people. Youth unemployment is much reduced from its peak in 2011, when it was knocking on 25%, and 113,000 young Scots were out of work. But committee rightly calls for more apprenticeship opportunities for older people, but not at the expense uh, of our younger people. In European countries that consistently have lower youth unemployment, consistently invest in high quality vocational education opportunities uh, for young people in good times and bad. And committee rightly called for more entrepreneurial thinking within our universities and colleges, but this should run throughout our education system, connecting the world of work uh, with the world of education. And I think we are seeing some fruits of our labour around curriculum for excellence, and in particular, the developing young Scotland's workforce agenda. Uh, because we need to recognise that, as Chris van der Kool said to committee, we have never lived in a period of such fast change as the one that we live in now, and that it will never again uh, be this slow. And my very final point, presiding officer, is that to have come to the other end of the financial crash only to enter Brexit is so tragic, and I fear the judgment of history and that that judgment uh, will be harsh upon us. But now uh, all of us must work together and work harder to make that vision of inclusive growth uh, a stronger economy and a fairer society a reality. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jamie Halkler Johnson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Jamie Halkler Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy, uh, sorry, the Presiding Officer. Um, given that previous attempts at humour seem to have cleared both the Chamber and um, I'm also, almost the public gallery, I'll be avoiding them today, you'll be delighted to hear. I promise. Um, I'm pleased to be able to speak uh, in today's uh, debate on our committee reports on Scotland's economic performance and on data, and I'll be focusing on the economic performance inquiry. And there'll be a number of uh, positive contributions already. I'd firstly like to thank our convener, Gordon Lindhurst, for his excellent summary of the work of the committee and our conclusions. And I'd also join him uh, in extending my thanks to all those who gave invaluable evidence, uh, both written and um, during the oral evidence sessions to the inquiry, and also to the clerking team uh, who helped tie together the significant body of work that has uh, gone into this report. Given the, uh, the subject matter of the inquiry, it was by necessity very wide ranging. It would be difficult to address its entire scope during a debate of this type. There are, however, a number of areas that I'd like to consider uh, that emerge from the inquiry. It's clear that Scotland's economy is diverse. In recent years, we have seen considerable divergence in the, success of, uh, in the success of individual sectors of our economy. And we've also noted in the report some of the regional challenges that I will come to later. While Scotland's economy has shown a level of health and resilience in recent years, it still suffers from a degree of fragility. It's against this backdrop that it's more important than ever that we look towards the future. We must ensure that our future prospects for growth are sustainable and that we do some of the heavy lifting now to address the long-term economic problems that have held back our businesses and employers in the past. In that respect, there is much to be welcomed in the report. The com committee looked back to consider our previous economic performance, but we also looked forward to examine some of the challenges we have to overcome and opportunities that we should be, we should be bold in harnessing. One area of particular interest to me as a member, of the Highlands and my member for the Highlands and Islands was the work around regional growth, we know well that there are significant disparities between Scotland's regions, but these also highlight underlying differences in these regional economies themselves, and often quite different priorities they have. While it's attempting to consider this as a divide between urban and rural, the economic distinctions between the rural borders and the rural highlands are at least as wide as they are between urban Edinburgh and urban Dundee. What is stark, however, is that these regional disparities can be self-sustaining. 
lower growth, lower investment in skills, depopulation, a lack of skilled jobs, and low pay become cyclical problems. Problems that become increasingly difficult to escape. In the committee's recommendations, we first outline the need to evaluate and consolidate Scottish government policies on the regional economies. Steps like this will be important if regions like the Highlands and Islands are to reach their potential. But above, but above all, we need focus from a government that recognises that a Scotland exists beyond our main central belt population centres. In its response, the government re referenced its work around regional partnerships and the creation of South of Scotland Enterprise en Agency. While regional partnerships have the potential to push beneficial change, their success will depend on the position that they are accorded and the ability they have to unite other stakeholders around a common vision for our regions. The report also recognised the key role of digital infrastructure as a dri driver of change in regional economies. This is something I've spoken about at some length, including in, the, in this chamber early in the week. An important point to draw out of our evidence, however, was that infrastructure must be accompanied by appropriate digital skills. Again, we saw that skills are a key component in investing in and realising human potential. As the report points out, the committee have agreed to look at this area in greater depth during a future inquiry. And while there are limits on the scopes of our, consideration, uh, of our consideration of skills in this inquiry, we did draw some useful conclusions. Work-based skills are a foundation on which economic success is built. Our recommendations considered a number of areas, particularly in-work training, reskilling, and our performance in matching skills to the needs of business and the wider economy. These are areas where the Scottish Government can make real and significant change. However, in-work skills are a responsibility of employers too, and the benefits of good quality training and development are very well established. Our evidence looked at the need of employers to properly fund and support the skills of their employees. Our findings on apprenticeships will in the main be familiar to policymakers. However, they certainly weren't repeating. The examples of where apprenticeships are more valued, some of the feedback from young people and the areas which are neglected. We also looked at support for innovation in the economy. While doing well in academic research, some of the wider research and development work lags behind international comparators. We heard, for example, that R&D spending as a share of GDP in Scotland was at just over 1.5%. That's compared to over 1.9% across the EU as a whole and behind the, behind the up to 4% seen in some of the fastest growing and most innovative countries. We noted the high productivity of businesses that are innovation leaders, but also some of the challenges that SMEs, for SMEs to innovate. I would hope that even beyond the scope of the recommendations in this area, the Scottish Government would reflect on some of the evidence that the committee had reported and consider what more can be done. Interna internationalisation and the funding to meet the Scottish Government's exporting targets was also covered in some length. Once again, we came across a common theme that has arisen in our work on government's interaction with business. As my colleague Dean Lockhart said, the problem of a cluttered landscape and the need for effective signposting of what support is available. Presiding officer, there is a range of sections of the report that I have not been able to cover even briefly today, but it has been a serious piece of work. These are, there are positives and negatives to be found in it. However, the committee has approached this openly and in the spirit of cooperation. We have found broad agreement on many recommendations we see as requiring the Scottish Government's attention. And I commend this report and that on data and hope that they will be useful in the months and years to come. Thank you very much. And I now call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Colin Beatty. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think most people in the Chamber this afternoon have already and will, will in the future focus their remarks on the economy. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and Richard Leonard um, for their kind remarks at the start of the debate? Long may that continue, Presiding Officer. The government will, of course, argue that everything is wonderful. They will share with you their set of statistics to prove their case, and then the opposition parties will rightly tell you how woeful it all is and have their statistics marshaled to support their narrative. The truth is, we could be doing a whole lot better. And as we face the Brexit storm, we need our economy to be resilient and we need it to be performing well if we are to stand any chance of mitigating the worst impacts of leaving the EU. The impact on jobs and business is going to be significant, yet I feel we are sleepwalking into this completely unprepared. Now just look at the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Fund. Set up by the Scottish Government, £200 million announced in the programme for government to extraordinary fanfare, yet this remains largely unallocated with only 0.5 million spent this year. 
The upshot is that it's simply not reaching the intended recipients to help them prepare. And it's another case of SNP rhetoric not quite matched by the reality. Now, very few people today will talk about the committee's other report on data, aside from the convener, and I really do consider that he could fill a slot opening up at the Stand Comedy Club. Many may think it dull, boring, the stuff to cure insomnia, but they would be fundamentally wrong. And at the risk of the chamber tuning out, this is what I want to focus on. Collecting the right data at the right time is critical to our understanding of how policies should be developed. It's critical to our understanding of their impact. Having confidence in that data and that the people gathering the data are independent and impartial is equally important. So access to data needs to be open, it needs to be transparent. This government's record on transparency is not a good one, I will indeed. Cabinet Secretary. Is Jackie Bailey suggesting for a moment or have any evidence that the statisticians are not independent and don't act impartially? Jackie Bailey. It's not the statisticians that I have concerns about. And actually, when you consider the government's record on transparency, it isn't good. Look at the experience of journalists and FOIs to the Scottish Government and the damning report from the Information Commissioner. Here was laid bare the culture of secrecy, the lack of transparency at the very heart of government, sanctioned by ministers and their special advisers. Hiding information, delivering what I can only describe as fact-free responses and generally sub subverting the process and principle of freedom of information. What it amounts to is deliberate obstruction and it's fundamentally dishonest and takes spin to new heights. So let me introduce you to pre-release access to statistics. This is the practice, as the conveners explained, where ministers get privileged access to statistics and days before the rest of us see them. The civil servants will argue that they need time to explain to ministers what they actually mean so they're more likely to get a measured response and be able to explain what they mean to journalists in turn. I don't have such a low opinion of the intelligence of ministers. Well, maybe not all of the time. But it is that privileged access which undermines public trust in official statistics. It creates opportunities for it to be spun or buried beneath an avalanche of other announcements. Now, the economy recommended that pre-release access um, should end, including Scottish GDP, the Scottish Retail Sales Index, quarterly national accounts, and government expenditure and revenues. ONS has stopped the practice. The Bank of England has stopped the practice. The Scottish Government, so keen to crow about being world leaders in all sorts of things, are content to follow far behind best practice and are ignoring the committee's recommendation. That is both disappointing and also very surprising. Derek Mackay hit the ground running as the new cabinet secretary. A flurry of activity, engagement with businesses, the mood music had changed. Here was a listening and responsive minister. No, I've taken one already. Just listen, just listen. Curiously, curiously, in the area of pre-release access to statistics, he's been the exact opposite. He's been slightly hostile. He's been uncharacteristically deaf to reason and sense. What is being suggested is not some radical left-wing notion, nor is it some neoliberal right-wing idea. It's not rocket science. Goodness me, the ONS do it, the Bank of England do it, the Scottish Government should really do it too. The time has come to end pre-release access to statistics. Now, I know the Cabinet Secretary might not always listen to me, but here is what other people had to say about it. Sir Charles Bean, former Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy at the Bank of England, said pre-release access to economic data should end. Jonathan Atho, Director General of Economic Statistics at the Office for National Statistics, said pre-release access to economic data should end. Ed Humpherson, Director General for Regulation at the UK Statistics Authority, said pre-release access to economic data should end. Derek Mackay seems to know better. And he says, he says he wants to work in consensus. He wants to listen. Here is the first test of him of that. So I urge him to listen, to act, to be open and transparent. And today, end pre-release access to statistics. And instead of shouting from a sedentary position, perhaps I can't, we're at 10, well, I'm 10 seconds over time, 
But can I suggest that the minister puts as much energy, as much energy into ending pre-release access to statistics as he does to shouting at me across the chamber? Thank you, colleagues. And I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, the health of the Scottish economy underpins the prosperity of Scotland. And since 2007, when the Scottish Government set its target to raise Scotland's GDP growth to UK levels, Scottish output grew more slowly than the UK's in 30 out of the subsequent 41 quarters. However, over the past six months, the Scottish economy is beginning to show signs of outpacing the UK's across various indicators. For example, figures published recently show that Scotland's un unemployment rate is lower than the UK's as a whole. Contemporary analysis of Scotland's economy makes for encouraging reading. Recent GDP figures show faster growth for Scotland in the first half of 2018. Our economy grew 0.5% in the second quarter of 2018, faster than in the UK at 0.4%, while our 0.9% growth in the first six months of this year exceeded the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecast of 0.7% growth for the full year. There is much more to Scotland's economy, of course, than GDP and jobs. Issues such as equality, job quality, household income debt ratios come into play. And we must also understand what aspects of the economy are the most important to ordinary people throughout Scotland. In terms of jobs and job creation, Scotland's employment rate increased from 73.8% in 2014 to 75.1% in May to July 2018. The unemployment rate decreased from 6.1% in 2014 to 3.8% in July to September 2018. With fully devolved powers or independence, we can implement further economic policies that continue to reflect a strengthening economy. And this evidence clearly displays that despite the global financial uncertainties affecting all economies, and after a decade of Westminster's austerity measures that were supposed to cure the UK's financial ills, but instead have promoted poverty and hardships, the measures the Scottish Government is taking to protect and promote the Scottish economy are fundamentally the right ones. There should be no doubt that Scotland is a successful country with assets that other countries covet. We stand, at the top, we stand in the top 25 global economies in terms of income per head and rank behind only London and the southeast of England in terms of most long-term indicators. Our exports of goods have increased 12% over the past year, the largest growth of any nation in the UK. However, despite the positive background, there are challenges that we'll face in the years to come. The threat of Brexit looms large on the economic horizon. Scottish Government analysis shows a hard Brexit could cost our economy £12.7 billion a year by 2030, compared to remaining in the EU, a figure that breaks down to a staggering £2,300 per person. The Bank of England has indicated that, to date, Brexit has reduced household incomes by up to £900, and the Fraser of Allender economic commentary states, a quote, a hard Brexit would act as a significant drag on Scotland's and the UK's economic potential. Sleepwalking into a no-deal outcome cannot be viewed as an effective economic plan. Now, more locally, in September when I spoke in the debate on bank closures, I highlighted the serious effect on local communities when such closures happen. Throughout Scotland and within my Midlothian North Mus and, and Musselburgh constituency, uh, there have been a number of closures and the inconvenience to local businesses and personal customers, many of whom are vulnerable and elderly, was considerable. Bank closures continue the pernicious hollowing out of our communities as libraries and other local facilities that form the heart of communities are closed or run down. Bonnerig is one of the largest towns in my constituency and contains a large number of small businesses whose turnover is mostly cash. They need to be able to bank those takings, but without a local bank or adequate arrangements through the post office, the businessman needs to take time out of his busy day to travel to the nearest bank branch or instead pay for the money to be uplifted. With the closure of Bonnerig and Pennycook branches of the Royal Bank of Scotland, Midlothian is left with only one RBS branch in Dalkeith, and while the RBS have a need to maximise their profit, it should not be at the expense of local services which support the local economy. Although RBS's most recent round of closures has brought the issue of branch banking to the fore, this is an issue that affects all banks and any solution must involve all banks. The worst impact of bank closures is felt by the most vulnerable members of our society, for many of whom going into a branch remains the only feasible way to conduct their banking. 
and it's high time the Tory Westminster Government stepped in to save local banking services. Their inaction to date has been appalling. Of course, as I've mentioned, one of the biggest challenges Scotland and the UK faces over the next few years is Brexit. And it's in our... Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, on the point about banking, does he support the effort by my Conservative colleague, the MP Colin Clark, in the House of Commons with his private member's bill on banking issues? Colin Beattie. Unfortunately, I have very little information on that myself, but uh, now the, the members mentioned it, I shall certainly find out more details. Uh, the ultimate economic impact of Brexit is not yet known, but it will affect every business and family in Scotland and it will exacerbate labour shortages and impede economic growth. Our export success is directly threatened by the prospect of removal of access to the single market and customs union. Now, if we were an independent nation and free to take our own decisions, we'd have the opportunity to focus on what truly matters to our economy and not have to rely on others who do not care for a Scottish voice. I hope it's been made clear that Scotland is currently in safe hands, while Westminster and the Tories willingly choose to ignore investment and support for local communities, the Scottish Government is taking forward actions to enhance and boost our economy. And these proposals include increasing the annual infrastructure investment year on year so that by 2025-26, it's £1.5 billion per year higher than in 2019-20, and meaning investment will be around £7 billion higher than current spending projections. Investing in our digital infrastructure, awarding £600 million of contracts to ensure superfast broadband to every business and home in Scotland, and introducing the legislation that will formally underpin our Scottish National Investment Bank. These examples have already been welcomed by businesses and industry. And with these and other actions, the Scottish Government's implementing point the way to long-term economic growth and are further proof of how we're taking a wide view as to how we secure the country's future in the years and decades to come. As a member of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee, I'm certain that I and my fellow members will continue our examination of the issues related to Scotland's economy and the data and criteria used. And I look forward to debating this topic in the Chamber in Thank the months you. to come. Thank you. Call Rachel Hamilton, followed by Tom Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for publishing their report on Scotland's economic performance. Economic growth in Scotland for the period of 2007-17 is significantly below Scottish Government targets, as we've already heard from many of the members today. The performance of the UK economy as a whole, historical trend growth, and that is against the UK Government and historical trend growth for Scotland and small EU countries. It's really a damning indictment for this SNP Government spelled out in black and white, clearly within the committee's report. And we've heard from Derek Mackay earlier on today about some of the reasons uh, over the past 10 years why that could be. But surely uh, not all of those uh, targets can have been missed because of those very reasons. There are other ways and policies that uh, Derek Mackay might consider to boost the economy. In fact, over the 11 years of this SNP government, um, we've seen them fail repeatedly to reach other economic performance targets. And to top this all off, the high tax agenda pursued by the government continues to damage our high streets um, and local communities and curtails the creation of jobs. And this ultimately impacts tax revenue and spending on services. And, and I want to move on to a point that was made um, in the evidence uh, sessions about large business supplement. And it um, implies very much about scaling up businesses. It's a deliberately misleading name I think, dreamt up by someone within the SNP. In reality, it's um, a tax on small family-owned local businesses who are having to cough up these additional taxes. Um, presiding officer, businesses in Scotland have been hit by an additional, additional 190 million, um, thanks to the doubling of the rates by the SNP. And across Scotland as a whole, it's estimated the total bill for big companies will be circa 129 million for this financial year. Had that rate, rate been kept on par with the rest of the UK, businesses would only have to pay circa 64 um, million. And it's um, almost doubled the large business supplement within my own constituency. But to add insult to injury, the government have forced high, the highest business rates in Europe onto Scottish companies. Um, Scottish businesses are paying currently 2% of GDP on business rates higher than elsewhere in Europe and also um, half a percent higher than in the UK. 
Uh, can I finish my point, please? The committee notes that the scale-up of companies has been a long-standing challenge in Scotland, noting that there is a lack of business confidence to do so. And it is unsurprising they have concluded this when Scottish businesses have been forced to withstand the policy decisions of this government. I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, would you just confirm that along with a reduction in taxes that should be paid into the public purse, there should be a reduction in expenditure? and she would support, therefore, a matching cut in either the health service or colleges or universities. Rachel Hamilton. I thank John Mason for that intervention. Obviously, the Chancellor has um, promised more money, 950 million in the autumn budget to the government for health spending. So um, I think it is, is a, a kind of a, a sort of ironic point that uh, John Mason actually mm -hmm. makes. But, presiding officer, um, the SNP tax plans um, hit family businesses, as I've just set out. And also individuals are uh, set to continue to pay for SNP fis fiscal decisions um, through their income tax. And um, the Chancellor brought about a tax cut for 32 million people. Um, he brought it forward by one year, which will deliver for workers across the United Kingdom, including here in Scotland. And he, he's going to raise, obviously, we all know he's going to raise the personal allowance and the higher rate threshold. He did this while passing on that extra funding uh, to uh, Scotland for perhaps the NHS, we hope that it will be um, used in, in the way that will benefit people of Scotland. Um, the, financial, the finance secretary must uh, follow a similar suit or we will see private and public sectors struggling to compete with other nations in the United Kingdom and that tax gra uh, gap will continue to grow. Uh, can I make a little bit of progress if you don't mind? Sorry. Um, Willie McLeod actually stated in the evidence given to the committee that um, regarding the differential rates of income tax in Scotland compared with the rest of the UK, the issues arising in relation to hospitality. Um, he'd spoken to a managing director of a large Scottish-based uh, company that operates throughout the UK and they have concern about the impact of those differential rates of income tax on um, bringing staff from the, uh, from England to positions in Scotland and they are thinking about how they can reward them appropriately when they re relocate and how they can encourage them to relocate. And this isn't just about highly paid chief executives and the like. Um, last year's Scottish budget put income um, tax up for those earning over 26,000. Um, presiding officer, it's clear that um, the, the recommendations that have been set out in the uh, report are a wake up call for the government to act upon and they are an achievable and positive set of recommendations which the government can work towards to help improve economic growth um, notwithstanding what I've just discussed regarding the issues um, affecting high streets and um, the differential in, in uh, wages throughout the UK sorry the personal allowance and the higher rate threshold in the in the country but uh, the committee were unequivocal in recommending that the economic strategy is reviewed and updated as a matter of urgency. And regarding the skills and uh, enterprise agencies, in particular the South of Scotland enterprise agency, I do agree with the committee that a clear focus on delivering the strategy is required. I'm glad that the committee believes that there is an opportunity for the South of Scotland enterprise agency to build a uh, um, transparent uh, measurement and evaluation in its activities from the outset. And um, moreover, I agree that there has to be a consistent, commonly held and settled definition of inclusive growth. And this should re be reflected within the enterprise and skills agencies' operational plans. Um, to conclude, um, we know we're stuck in a cycle of low growth, weak investment and fragile confidence that's hitting our local communities and high streets hard. I just hope that um, within the decisions that Derek Mackay makes, he makes sensible ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by James Kelly. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this debate. I had the great pleasure and privilege of being a member of the Economy Committee um, earlier this year and I had an opportunity to participate in the inquiry on Scotland's economic performance and I would like to join former committee colleagues in paying tribute to the work of the clerks and to my fellow uh, former committee members for all their hard work and endeavour in producing what is um, quite an extensive and by its very nature very wide-ranging um, report which I think uh, and the wide-ranging nature of the report has been reflected in, in, in much of the debate this afternoon. Um, I think one of the first things that I would like to pick up on is the narrative that some opposition members are seeking to construct, which is of 10 or 11 years of SNP government um, that has 
failed to address matters of economic growth. Um, I appreciate why the opposition do that. That's, they see that as their job and anything in the nature of a zero-sum game of political debate is that parties don't want to admit that the other party has a point. But I think if we had any reasonable consideration of where Scotland was in 2007 and where we find ourselves as we enter 2019, there has really been considerable change for the better. Just taking infrastructure alone. When I come from the west of Scotland to Edinburgh for my week in Parliament, I, I now travel on a, an electrified railway line. I can... The, certainly. Willie Rennie. I did acknowledge that the, the oil industry downturn has had an impact. Does he, in the spirit that he was talking about, acknowledge any of the points that we're making about the performance of the Scottish Government? Tom Arthur. I think the Scottish Government, when they, they came to power, were within 18 months um, faced with part of, you know, the greatest fiscal crisis since the Wall Street crash in 1929. And they were doing so within a parliament with a limited suite of powers. And they were also doing in a minority parliament. And I would reflect and I would remind members very gently that for the majority of time this government's been in power, it has been as a majority government. Therefore, there is a collective responsibility in this parliament for decisions that have been taken. But as just as I say, I can now go on an electrified railway line from Glasgow to Edinburgh, I can drive the length of the M8, which is completed. Very shortly, the AWPR will open, the M80 has been completed, the M74. And if we think about these projects, they are projects which were first mooted as far back as the 40s, 50s and 60s. And it took an SNP government for them actually to be delivered. So I think that is a testament to the record of this government and actually getting on with the job. And I think had there not been an SNP government, we would still be waiting for many of these important measures to have been undertaken. There has been some very important points made for, um, in this uh, debate regarding skills. I would just like to, uh, I think it may have been Jamie Halcrow Johnson, he's not in his place at the moment, but he spoke about the need for a pairing up between the demands of business and what we deliver in terms of education. And I would draw the cha Chamber's attention, as I have previously, to the work of AC White, a construction company based in my constituency of Renfrewshire South in my hometown of Barhead, who have partnered up with West College Scotland to deliver a training course, a college course, a one-year course with a guaranteed employment at the end of it. And I very much welcome uh, the work of AC White have undertaken in this regard in their partnership with West College Scotland. And I think it's a, a model that can be expanded on and developed. I think clearly the elephant in the room in much of this debate has been Brexit. When the uh, report was published, it obviously predated the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration, which is only hours old. But I think what we can already deduce and understand from the UK government's proposed deal is that it does not deliver in either the desires of Remain voters or Leave voters beyond ending freedom of movement. And as this report alludes to, we face significant demographic pressures in Scotland. We know that over the next 25 years, our pension age population will increase by 25%. Um, our over 75 population will increase by 80%. All the while, our working age population will only increase by 1%. And as the work the Finance and Constitution Committee has been undertaking on the fiscal framework demonstrates, this poses significant challenges and a significant threat to Scotland. The ending of freedom of movement would be a catastrophe, and it will be a catastrophe for Scotland. Not only does it benight us, does it deny us that engagement and that enriching experience that freedom of movement brings, not only does it could have a devastating impact on Scotland's music sector, which I take a keen interest in as a, someone with a musical background and as a convener of the cross-party group in music. Fundamentally, it poses a, a threat to our public services, health and social care, to many of our industries in agriculture, for example, which members have alluded to. And fundamentally, it denies us the working age population of taxpayers we need Yes, to fund our public services, but also to work in our private sector. And we know the contribution that EU nationals make. They are highly qualified, hardworking and diligent individuals who make a huge contribution. So this is a almost, and for some areas of Scotland as well, the end of free freedom of movement is an existential threat. And I know that's something that the Minister Kate Forbes will be very much aware of in the constituency that she represents. So I think while it's important that we have these debates and we always look for ways in which we can improve and as 
Jackie Bailey rightly said, we can always do things better. And I think if we didn't believe we could do things better, we wouldn't bother running to be members of this parliament in the first place. But the biggest threat we face right now is Brexit. And the only solution, the only response that we can make to that, short of staying within the European Union, is continued membership of the single market and customs union and continuing within that freedom of movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Kelly to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Mr MacDonald is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Kelly, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And, uh, the Chamber will be glad to know that I, I'm not going to try to tell any jokes. I couldn't think, don't think I could compete at all with uh, Mr Lindhurst. Um, the, uh, I think the, the debates raised some interesting issues. Clearly, there's been a lot of uh, coverage in relation to statistics and data, which has been part of the inquiries that the committee has looked into. And I think something we can all agree on is the importance of good quality and consistent data uh, to ensure that we can then inform policy choices, even if we disagree as to what the policy choices are. Uh, I think that, that is, it is important that the, the data is accurate. Um, I think moving on, you know, from the, the statistics, you know, listening to Derek Mackay, he uh, spoke up for the government's record in terms of delivery on the real living wage. But we heard from Rich Richard Leonard a statistic that there were 470,000 people in Scotland not being paid the real living wage. And I suppose I think it's important to try and draw underneath the, the, the statistic to see what, what that actually means. And you know, talking to some young people in my local area recently, what, what I actually meant was that because they weren't being paid a proper wage, some of them had three jobs, you know, in order to, to, to make ends meet, to just to be able to uh, pay bills and, um, you know, to, to stay in a, in, a, in a house that was wind and water tight. So that is the reality that, are, you know, far too many people, particularly young people, are facing uh, in Scotland. And I think it's tight. Yes, yeah, sure, I'll give way. Tom Arthur. I'm very grateful to the member uh, for giving way. Does he agree with me that we should end the national minimum wage and it should be a national living wage for all workers and that we should end this iniquitous pay discrimination against 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 and 24 year olds? James Kelly. Well, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll jump on. To answer that, I'll jump on to another bit of my speech because I was going to talk about procurement and the importance of procurement in order to be able to mandate the, the real living wage because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all very well having guidance and good practice if we ha as we do currently in public procurement uh, projects. But um, when this issue was bought, brought to the floor of this parliament in 2014, the SNP on five occasions uh, voted against mandating the living wage in public, in public, sector, uh, in public sector projects. And what I would, the, the reason given for that was that it was going to be against EU law. So whereas we all regret the onset of Brexit, perhaps one of the, the aspects of Brexit does come to pass will be that we're not subject to that EU law then and I look forward to the SNP then bringing forward the appropriate changes to procurement legislation to mandate uh, the payment of the living wage in all public pro projects. And that would, that would go a long way to addressing the concerns of the young people I was talking to in my local area recently, who, as I said, were having to do uh, three different jobs. Um, I think some of the other areas that we can look at, I think Willie Rennie made a good point in relation to grant assistance. Uh, and I made the, the, the case today at First Minister's questions in relation to the Two Sisters plant at Cambus Lang. Uh, it's, it's been revealed earlier this week uh, under Freedom of Information that Scottish Enterprise paid the Two Sisters group half a million pounds in 2013. And he did so on the basis that the company would keep the plant open until 2020. And sadly, the plant closed earlier this year with a loss of 450 jobs. And that's had a real devastating impact on Canvas Lang. I think it's an absolute scandal that the Two Sisters group have still retained that half a million pounds 
within, within their company. And I know Nicola Sturgeon said at First Minister's questions that Scottish Enterprise were undertaking to recover the money. But you've got to wonder why, you know, months after the plant's actually closed, they've still actually got the money. If, if supposedly the, the, the legal agreement was, was tied up properly. Uh, and I repeat my call that, you know, that half a million pounds when it comes back, it should be reinvested in Cambus Lang uh, in order to alleviate the economic vandalism that uh, the Two Sisters group have wrecked on that local community. I think some of the other important areas that we could look at in terms of improving the economy is the, the use of the cooperative model. Uh, I don't think the government have done enough uh, to promote that. The cross-party group and cooperatives are actually running an inquiry currently looking at that model in relation to housing. And our, a recent presentation from a student co-op demonstrated how uh, rents were, they were able to deliver rents of about £350, uh, actually less than half of the, the, the kind of rent level for the rest of the city of Edinburgh. So that showed a real benefit, uh, not only to those students, but a benefit to the economy if people can save money on their rents. So I think the government should look at that. And they should also look more at the area of uh, technology, particularly improving the number of women who, are, uh, who hold positions in the technology sector, because that currently runs at less than 20%. So there are some interesting areas that we need to pick up on if we're going to move uh, Scotland forward to be a driving force in the economy in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. Call Gordon MacDonald, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the committee's economic performance report opens with the words, it's now been a decade since the beginning of the financial crash and the subsequent Great Recession, and that this 10-year milestone marked a timely opportunity to look at the performance of the economy. So how is Scotland's economy performing? A number of witnesses, for example, Professor John McLaren, Graham Jones and Professor Sarah Carter, highlighted the impact of the financial and oil price crisis on two of our most productive sectors and therefore the economy as a whole. Despite that, the committee heard that compared to other countries and regions of the UK, Scotland is actually performing well. Even without North Sea oil and gas extraction, Scotland is still the third most productive of the 12 regions of the UK, with productivity sitting just below the UK average. Indeed, only London and the southeast of England are more productive than Scotland. Furthermore, Scotland's productivity grew by 7.8% between 2007 and 2016 in real terms, a growth rate higher than that seen in any other country or region of the UK. Research conducted by the Scottish Parliament Information Centre highlighted that three of Scotland's four nuts two regions all display above average EU productivity levels with the Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire area ranking 19th of the 266 EU regions in 2015. When comparing the percentage change in productivity over the period 2007 to 2016, it shows that of the 23 Scottish nuts three areas, 19 grew faster than the UK average growth rate. That improved productivity is important if you want to trade with countries across the world. And as a result, between 2010 and 2016, the value of Scotland's international exports grew by 24%. In 2016, exports to EU destinations totaling 12.7 billion, an increase of 19%, and exports to non-EU destinations were 17.1 billion, up 28%. Our increased sales to the world have helped support the growth in new businesses in Scotland, that has increased dramatically post evolution with 100,000 more businesses now than in 2000, the highest level of private sector businesses since records began. Those businesses get better support than elsewhere in the UK and that is one of the reasons why the Scottish five-year survival rate is higher than the UK average. Better employment prospects over the 11 years is reflected in the latest labour market update that highlights that 3.8% Scotland is the lowest unemployment levels in the UK 
and that we met our target to reduce youth unemployment by 40% four years early. On the living wage, Scotland remains the best performing of all four UK countries with the highest proportion of employees, 81.6%, paid the living wage or more, and that Scotland is the highest pay anywhere in the UK outside of London in the South East, with ONS figures showing median full-time gross annual pay has grown 21% in the last 10 years. With a highly skilled workforce, we continue to be the top destination for foreign direct investment outside of London. Business research and development spend in Scotland grew by over one billion for the first time in 2016, representing a 69% real terms increase since 2007, compared to a 22% increase in UK spend over the same period. Scotland has changed for the better over the last 11 years under this government, but there is more that can be done. We require better stats on the Scottish economy. Our conclusions on our inquiry, how to make data count, highlighted a number of points that need to be addressed. Although Scotland is now much better served than Wales, Northern Ireland and the English regions in terms of data, we still lack many of the statistical measures produced routinely at a UK level and in other countries. The government needs to discuss with the ONS and HMRC and others how that, those gaps can be filled. They also have to introduce more data sharing agreements to improve coverage and quality of data. And importantly, we need to address the matter of UK-wide companies not having to report specifically on their activities in Scotland. In Scotland's economic performance report, the committee welcomed the Enterprise Strategic Board's focus on decluttering and streamlining of the enterprise and skills support landscape. However, one area that needs to be examined is how businesses are supported from start-up to high growth. As witnesses highlighted that despite the Scottish Government spending two billion a year on economic development, there is a divide when businesses separate from Business Gateway and look to move to Scottish enterprise. There is not a smooth transition from one to the other agency. On apprenticeships, I welcome the Scottish Government's target of 30,000 modern apprenticeships by 2020. However, we have to ensure that we are supporting the learning and upskilling of all our people, including those citizens who are disabled, care leavers, and those from black and ethnic minority communities. Presiding officer, Scotland has changed for the better over the last 11 years. Yes, we can do better, but we also need the tools to do so. Maybe the parties who highlight the deficiencies in Scotland's economic performance should think about how they voted over the last 11 years when there was the opportunity to devolve more powers to this place. Thank you. Closing speech is a call on Rhoda Grant to close for Labour, please. Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I also thank the committee for the reports and shining a light on why our economy has grown so slowly. And I think there are some strong practical recommendations in those reports that should be considered by the government. James Kelly talked about the cooperative model, which was mentioned in the report, and that's something that's close to my own heart as a co-op party member. And Richard Leonard talked about um, both employee-owned and co-op models because they boost productivity and economic growth. And that was something highlighted in the report. They provide better conditions and security uh, for workers. And precarious work is something that came up in this debate a couple of times in Joanne Lamont's intervention and later on by James Kelly in some depth where he spoke about the issues that young people face working three jobs um, to try and make a living. And some of those jobs will be zero-hour contracts and others will be precarious as well because young people have very few rights in the labour market and I think that is something 
that we have to address. We also need to address our own um, Indigenous businesses and how we support them. Um, I have had companies come to me, local companies that have built up a trade locally um, and maybe looking to retire and looking for models to make sure that business stays in local hands with local people and that that continues to make a, an input to the to their local economy. Too often those businesses are picked off and assets stripped for their contracts and then the local, the local workforce are left on their own. So we, we need to make sure that those indigenous businesses get as much support as others. And I think a rather shocking statistic brought out in the debate was that a third of the Scottish economy is overseas owned. And um, Willie Rennie also pointed out that that means that much of the financial incentives that we give to companies go to those overseas companies as well. So surely we should be looking to hold some of that at home to support our own businesses because it's very clear that when times get tough, if you are rooted to where you are working, you are much more likely to try and stay and weather the storm rather than move away. And that, again, something highlighted by James Kelly, both um, in the debate and indeed earlier in question time, about two, the two sisters organisation that have half a million pounds of government Can funding. I take, uh, an intervention on the floor? Yep. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Rhoda Grant for taking the intervention? I'm just suddenly mindful that there is a 32-page response to the committee report that I've sent to the committee on the 3rd of September. Could Rhoda Grant say, notwithstanding the comments she's making, which recommendation uh, that I've responded to does she think I've failed to deliver on in terms of this 32-page response to the committee report? Rhoda Grant. There are many, and I'm hoping that I will touch on them, them as I go through responding to the debate, because indeed they were raised here um, in the debate today. But can I just finish the point I was making about James Kelly's intervention about two sisters, because government have given them half a million pounds. Could that money not have been given to the workforce to try and save that business or indeed grow another business in its place? Would that not have been better spent and they would have been able to stay in their own communities? James also spoke about procurement, and I think we need to use that to support some of those local companies, but also to promote a real living wage um, because one of the other shocking statistics that came out in the debate was that 470,000 people are um, receiving less than the real living wage. The real living wage is what it has been proven people need in order for them to be able to live to a reasonable standard. So the, those people are actually living below a standard that we would deem to be acceptable. And I don't think that's right in a modern Scotland. Um, Angela Constance talked about inclusive growth and I think it is very important that we look at how women um, are treated within the workforce and indeed the value given to female um, entrepreneurs was, was something else that was um, talked about in the report. I was at a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association conference, a women's conference, um, where women entrepreneurs were um, making presentations to the group. And what was really stark about what they were saying is most of them couldn't find work that would fit with their caring responsibilities, so therefore set up their own companies in order that they could make a living. And they, in turn, then um, employed other women and made sure that their conditions were flexible. So I think there is a lot to be done, but setting up your own business shouldn't be seen as the last resort. It should be seen as something we would encourage people to do because it creates wealth in our communities. The other issue that was touched upon um, in the report and indeed in the debate was automation um, and the challenges and indeed the opportunities that automation can bring um, to build a high-wage, high-skilled economy and it can boost pro productivity as well. And the report says skills are crucial for the capitalisation of these developments. But yet we're seeing that companies do not have the skills to use either digital or indeed uh, automation. We need to be reskilling our, our whole workforce. And I was quite concerned, I met with Scottish Retail Consortium uh, this morning and we're talking about apprenticeships and apprenticeship levy. And they were quite clear that this wasn't working properly, certainly for the retail sector. They said the average age of a start in that sector was 27 years of age, usually because their hours were more family friendly. Um, and 
these people couldn't access apprenticeships um, because of their age, and I don't think that is right. We really need to look at reskilling and making sure our workforce are ready for the future. I'm seeing the presiding officer looking at me as if I should be winding up. So I just have to emphasise that the economy is hugely important because without a vibrant economy, we can't do the things we want to do by tackling poverty, health inequality, and indeed um, creating a, a country that we can all be proud of. Thank you very much. Uh, I now close, call on Murdo Fraser to close for the Conservatives. Mr Fraser, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, this debate uh, started uh, with the uh, convener, Gordon Lindhurst, with his uh, trademark swashbuckling style in delivering, <laughs> delivering the committee's views. Uh, we, were, we, were, uh, we were then tantalised, tantalised by Angela Constance, telling us it was a unique experience being on the committee, but not elaborating in what respect it was unique. I don't know if it was having to listen to the convener's jokes or, or quite what it was. Uh, perhaps you will tell us later and privately what was uh, so unique about it. Uh, I want to pick up a few issues that come up in the debate and say some things about, about aspects of the report that I, I think are important. A, a number of members, the convener himself uh, and Dean Locker and Jackie Bailey talked about this issue of pre-release of data. And it, it was clear from what was said that statistical bodies uh, all support an end to this pre-release of data, and I've all said it's not good practice. The only people who seem to take a contrary view uh, are the Scottish Government. And I would ask them to, to reflect uh, upon that particular issue and, and consider whether, in fact, it is time to change practice. Uh, of course. My point. Of course. Cabinet is, Secretary. Is Murdo Fraser aware that actually this is primarily a decision for the Chief Statistician who makes his own judgment on this rather than Ministers? Therefore, it would be for him to decide whether to propose a change or not. So it's not actually a ministerial decision. Murdo Fraser. Well, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure, of course, the, the, such as the, the, the weight and influence of the Economy and Finance Secretary, if he were to have a gentle word in the ear of the Chief Statistician, that might have some bearing on his decision-making in that respect. Well, I will, but it's very brief. This is getting interesting. Uh, Cabinet would, Secretary. Presiding officer, would that not constitute, some would argue, interference, which is the very accusation uh, that the opposition is suggesting we would want to avoid? Murdo Fraser. Perhaps the answer to this, Deputy Presiding Officer, is for Parliament to express a view on the matter, so there's no question of undue influence, and that way that could be addressed. Um, well, I'd love to take that. I, I really, I, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you time if you want well, to take if, Mr Lindhurst. Yes, come on, come here. Um, just, just to correct the, the Cabinet Secretary, the, the point is that under current legislation, that is the position, but it is the current regulations and legislation, the way it is set up, that is the issue and the problem. Mr Fraser. Thank you. Well, I'm grateful to the Convener for, for uh, clarifying that matter. Perhaps I will move on quickly to, to other matters. A number of members talked about Scotland's economic performance more generally, and we had an exchange between Willie Rennie and Tom Arthur on that particular issue. And I, I, I understand the point that, that Mr Arthur was, was making in relation to headwinds around Scottish economic performance, and he talked about the financial crash, and he talked about Brexit, which of course has not yet happened. But surely the issue is the relative performance of the Scottish economy compared to the UK as, the, as a whole. And here, Fraser of Allender, who have, are the closest we have to you know, a gospel when it comes to these issues, have pronounced that they believe there's been a decade of underperformance for the Scottish economy relative to uh, the UK. And indeed, they've said for that period, the Scottish economy has grown at a third of the UK rate in the last decade. So I think we should reflect upon that. And when it comes to Brexit, of course, we now have a very clear choice. We have the Prime Minister's deal on Brexit or no deal. And I would encourage members and indeed the Scottish Government to do what... Well, no, I'm, look, I've taken three interventions already, Mr Arthur. I'll have no time to make all the very important points I want to make if I take another intervention, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, I, think, I think members should listen to what industry bodies like the CBI and the National Farmers Union of Scotland are saying and sign up to the Prime Minister's deal. Now, in relation to other points in the report, one of the things that somewhat depressed me about this debate and the report is that it could have taken place really at any time over the past decade. I served on the economic, economy committees, or its equivalent, in two previous sessions of this parliament. And the work that the committee has now done in this session has some depressingly familiar themes. Looking at how we improve productivity, how we enhance exports, how we commercialize research from our universities, are all issues we've been talking about for the last 10 or 15 years. That's not to say there aren't some valuable uh, 
uh, points made in this report, and some of the conclusions do need highlighting. In relation to economic strategy, I I, I've lost count of the number of new economic strategies we've had over the past two decades. We have had individual strategies across a whole range of sectors. And as the Fraser of Allender have pointed out in a recent report, a very cluttered landscape in terms of what these strategies are intended to deliver. And Dean Lockhart made this point in his contribution. And the committee recommended that the Scottish Government produces an, an action and implementation plan for his economic strategy backed up with a monitoring and evaluation plan. That's two more plans, I appreciate, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it seems to me that actually getting things done is now more important than producing yet more strategies, and I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary would agree with that. The economy only exists because we have businesses, and we know from recent figures there have been a fall in the number of enterprises we have in Scotland, and historically we have had lower levels of entrepreneurship in Scotland compared to the UK as a whole. And the committee noted the evidence on the need to ensure that Scotland is a good place to do business. And Rachel Hamilton, in her contribution, uh, uh, touched on this particular point, and we hear again and again from business representative organisations that we must keep Scotland competitive in terms of tax with the rest of the United Kingdom. I hope that's something that the Cabinet Secretary will address in his budget uh, next month. And I was pleased to see the committee address this issue of the missing middle in terms of Scottish business, and Willie Rennie touched on that in his contribution. This is an issue that's long been identified. We have a good number of large, secure businesses and a wide range of SMEs, but what has always been missing in the Scottish economy, compared with comparators, particularly Germany, are those substantial middle-range businesses. And it is these middle, missing middle businesses that the committee heard perhaps struggle to access the support they need to grow. They fall between two schools. They are, they are too large for startup support, yet too small to benefit from Scottish enterprise account management. And that is an area where there needs to be greater focus. Deputy Presiding Officer, I was going to close in a moment. Just, I want to make some comments in closing on the question of the Scottish National Investment Bank, because I think this is actually uh, important. It's a welcome initiative and it fulfills an unmet need. But it will not achieve much, as the committee has said, if it is not sufficiently focused. And I think there is a concern. When we hear calls, and we heard them from Mr. Leonard earlier in this debate, for too much direction to be given to that investment bank and for political interference in terms of how it might lend money. And I have a concern that every time we get a business failure, whether it's Michelin, as we're hearing about in Dundee at the moment, or wherever else, there will be calls for SNIB to use its resources to invest. Whatever the merits of these calls in a general sense, that is not what a Scottish National Investment Bank should be about. And I believe it's going to be successful. Ministers need to appoint good people to run it and then get out of the way and let them take decisions themselves. Thank in closing, you. presiding officer, I think no, it's a very I worthwhile must, report, you must and I commend it to the chamber. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Derek Mackay to close for the government. Cabinet secretary. Well, surprisingly, presiding officer, I actually agree with much of the report as well, and said so in my 32-page response to the committee to say there's actually a lot of consensus in this, and welcomed much of it, which is why I said what did members feel was missing from the recommendations, notwithstanding the genuine difference of opinion on pre-release access to data that I'll return to. But let's just reflect on that. One of the recommendations is that we should establish an economic consensus in Scotland. And I genuinely think that this debate was an argument of some of us, some of the time, arguably including me, relying upon the lines that we believe in, but need to work a wee bit harder on finding the economic consensus, because it's the only way I think we'll make progress and deliver the actions on which we appear to agree. And certainly Gordon Lindhurst was a champion of the committee report, but I hope we'll equally reflect on what I felt was a very constructive response uh, to the committee's uh, recommendations. So in that sense, I agree with Murdo uh, Fraser, not often I say that, but on the actions that are required, I actually thought Jamie Halcrow Johnston gave a very fair and considered uh, speech. I thought that Angela Constance, so that's your career knackered, um, Angela Constance uh, gave a very powerful and uh, articulate speech around how growing the economy and tackling inequality actually go hand in hand. I believe in economic growth because I think through economic growth we can tackle inequality in our society and that's what drives me. 
Now, it is true that our economic indicators are strengthening in terms of GDP growth, outperforming the, United, the rest of the United Kingdom over the last 12 months, or unemployment at near record low at 3.8%, or things like foreign direct investment in a stronger position, second only to London in the southeast of England, or exports growing. But I have spent the last few months listening to business, and I have to say, Pre-release access to data has not been the number one issue that they have been raising with me on the things that we need to do to grow our economy. It is not a ministerial decision. And I have to say to the Tories particularly, and to those who used to be in power, it's more a question of do as we say, not as we do. Whereas in Whitehall, pre-release access still exists. And I'm convinced that some members of the opposition, just some members, no matter how much time you give them to look at the evidence, they still won't look at the facts to come to the right decision. And a case in point of that has to be Brexit. I won't take any lectures from the Tory party on economic planning. When you look at the madness that is Brexit right now, totally mismanaged by the Tory party. And for Dean Lockhart to say, let's see how it pans out. How reckless can you be with people's jobs and people's lives. Now, we already know that the Tories have adopted austerity as an ideology. That in itself has harmed our economy. It hasn't supported our economy. It has harmed our business growth and our economy. And I listen very... Oh, I have a choice. I'll have a choice. Who should I take? Oh, Dean Lockhart's still standing. I should take Myrtle oh, well. Fraser. <laughs> Mr Lockhart. Yeah. Th thank you for giving way. Uh, the uh, policies of the UK government apply across the UK. So why has the rest of the UK economy, since the financial crisis, grown by 1.2%, but under your government, only by 0.7%? There is only one explanation. It is the input and policies of your government. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland's more uh, dependent on the oil and gas supply chain than the rest of the United Kingdom as a whole. That's an explanation as to why we have been impacted by the downturn. But in terms of the new Tory, Scottish Tory economic strategy, you said our strategy wasn't good enough and we had too many strategies. So did you hear what the new Tory idea was? Apart from cut taxes for the rich in society, the new big idea was a new framework. That was the big idea from Dean Lockhart. Now, we're getting on with the actions to grow our economy, and that's why GDP in Scotland over the last 12 months is now outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. To be fair to Willie Rennie, I thought it was quite a considered, if, if um, maybe not best informed uh, speech that he's ever made to the chamber, I would say that. But he made the case about the Scottish economy underperforming as part of the union. Then he said, but we're still better together, to then go on and say, that immigration policies will adversely impact Scotland's economy, the UK's economy, but Scotland's economy disproportionately, and he's 100% right. We should have powers over immigration so we can make the right choices to support our society and our economy as well as doing the right thing. And then we turn to another friend of Better Together, the Labour Party, who want us to take more actions around the living wage and employability, but don't want to give us the powers to do so. They would rather have that in the hands of the Conservatives as well. And then I heard about Labour's industrial strategy. Not only do we have policies to support the industries in Scotland and the emerging industries of Scotland, we have intervened to save jobs and unapologetically will continue to do so to protect industrial jobs in Scotland. If you want to look what interventions look like under the SNP, Liberty Steel, we're making steel again. We're building ships and we did intervene on BIFAB. So we will take the right actions to support our economy. Oh yes, so yeah, you should maybe hold off on that particular one. I only have about a minute or so left, presiding officer. I do think our economic interventions are right around investing more in our infrastructure and in inclusive growth on innovation. So we are the creators of our economic success and not just the consumers. Also tackling more around internationalization and exports. NMIS, a future industrial uh, growth opportunity from advanced technology. More around, as I say, our export strategy. The National Investment Bank will be transformational. The enterprise agency supporting startups and scale-ups. The South of Scotland enterprise agency supporting that part of the country. City deals stimulating our regional economies. Innovation centres to work with the public and the private sector. Rates reform to ensure that we have the best package of rates anywhere in the United Kingdom. 
Working with the UK, UK government, yes, on the industrial strategy to make sure that we maximise the funds from that particular channel, stimulating our economy, providing stability eh, and stimulus as well. So important to support entrepreneurship at this point in time, as well as a real focus on digital, women and enterprise too, and fairness as part of our economic strategy. So I've set out some of the actions that we will take to stimulate our economy whilst the Tories try and wreck the economy with their ideological approach to Brexit, which has put us in such a precarious position. Thank you. I call on John Mason to close for the committee. Mr Mason, till decision time, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener, um, presiding officer, I mean. Um, <laughs> I was about to start off by mentioning the convener, of course, and uh, commend him for the very collegiate approach I think we have on the uh, committee. I think there was a lot of agreement on the committee identifying issues, and many of these issues have come up this afternoon in the debate. But I think the reality is that none of us uh, have a magic wand and can always clearly see what is the way to solve uh, some of these challenges that we have been facing and that we are facing. And if I can just uh, reiterate a couple of points that the uh, convener made at the beginning. First of all, to very much thank Graham Roy for his input into both the reports. Each report runs to some 100 pages, so there's a lot of material in there. And uh, Graham Roy was extremely uh, helpful to the committee. And, and also the point I think that's worth reiterating that the convener made, which was that uh, data and statistics are there to serve the users uh, and not vice versa. Uh, and I think there is room uh, for movement uh, from where we've been on that. Uh, if I start, as others, some others have done on the, on the data side, there was actually quite a lot in the data report uh, other than just pre-release access, which I will come to. Um, but I think there were some very uh, positive points. I think the fact that ONS said they were extremely willing to engage and wanted to engage more with the Scottish Parliament uh, was very positive, and the committee will be keen to develop that. Uh, the fact that uh, we need to prioritise uh, getting data on earnings, on trade, on Scottish prices, uh, on regional uh, figures, it was very much agreed as well. I think a positive reaction to the Digital Economy Act of 2017 uh, and the fact that we should now have more access to HMRC data uh, and the question of how the gaps can be filled, which I think Gordon MacDonald mentioned. The barriers that we still face, the cost of getting data, the lack of power we have in certain sectors, and uh, the fact that there is no disaggregation uh, either for many companies or other organisations. Uh, I think Gordon Lindhurst also touched on the requirements of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and having been involved in the Finance Committee which it, when it was set up, uh, I do think that has to be a priority for all of us. Uh, and one I think that hasn't been mentioned was the link we made in the report to the gender pay gap which we had previously uh, studied and the fact that uh, there's a need for gender disaggregated data, which largely we don't have. And I think both Kezia Dugdale and Gillian Martin were on the committee when we did uh, the report, but are no longer uh, there. But clearly in the data side, while most of it was collegiate, we did divide uh, on the question of pre-release access. Uh, there were three positions before this afternoon, although I think Angela Constance has added a fourth, uh, which is sitting on the fence. But uh, I would maintain that the minority view in the committee is still the best one and that although the committee went strongly for pre-release of everything, and although the government has stood by its position of not changing anything, eh, the minority view on the committee was that there should be a presumption against pre-release access and inviting the government to put forward arguments on a case-by-case -case basis. Eh, and I still think that is a good way forward. Next, if I could eh, just touch on one or two issues which I think have hardly been mentioned this afternoon or not mentioned at all. Productivity, eh, we spent quite a lot of time discussing eh, and came in, up with a lot of the witnesses. Eh, and there is, has been the assumption that increasing productivity is going to automatically be good. Eh, although the question eh, did come up that in fact, in some sectors like in a restaurant, you actually want more staff and eh, more productivity is not necessarily a great thing. I think technology and automation have not been mentioned too much, although Rhoda Grant did mention them in her closing speech. And we did feel that the enterprise and skill agencies need to really focus in on that. Again, the care sector has hardly been mentioned, but this is nowadays clearly a huge part of the Scottish economy. And uh, while it does not export and it does not attract tourists, it is a growing sector. 
and is a sector where the pay is very poor and one we need to take seriously. Uh, another issue, entrepreneurial thinking, and uh, particularly we were uh, focusing on colleges and universities where that is much more part of the thinking but also uh, the fact that uh, at schools now, that I think there's more emphasis on that as well, which is a good thing. And we saw that very much at the recent Business and Parliament conference, uh, which the Economy Committee was involved in sponsoring. Procurement as well has not been mentioned, and we did feel that many SMEs are not, still not achieving uh, the share of public expenditure that they could be, and perhaps they are in other countries. Uh, growth sectors were not mentioned to a great extent, although Willie Rennie talked about needing to broaden the economy. And I think we did wonder if the past system has been too rigid in, in the way that Scottish Enterprise in particular has focused on what it helps. And we did wonder if improving low productivity sectors would be something else that would make a, an impact on the economy. A, the Scottish National Investment has been mentioned. A, as a very positive step forward and I think we did agree that all investment decisions should have equality impact assessments a, but at the same time I do agree with Murdo Fraser that it is not there to bail out a, struggling companies that is not its main aim. A, decluttering has been mentioned a few times and I think we saw the strategic board as a positive way forward in a, seeking to declutter a, some areas. Now, to touch on other areas that uh, particularly have been mentioned a fair bit, I think what's, this is what's called the fear of heights or scaling up or the middle sector that's missing. It was something we looked at and certainly concerns me quite a lot. We seem to be good at starting companies and growing relatively small companies, but I think the question comes as to whether some of them are sold too soon. And we had a very useful meeting with Skyscanner, who may have sold at the right time. Uh, time will tell about that, but at least they waited a lot longer than a lot of other companies have done uh, to sell off. But we do still face the fact that uh, the financial press or the financial pages often rejoice when a small company is sold for a sizable sum, even if it might, if it might have grown. The points too about ownership, uh, we've not spent very much time on social enterprises uh, as an option, and I think we felt that Scottish Enterprise and HIE maybe need to focus on that more and also that potential entrepreneurs should think about that uh, when they're starting up their companies. But ownership is very important, employee ownership, embedding companies uh, within Scotland and Michelin and others have been mentioned uh, where an overseas branch may be more easily closed uh, than one that is based here, although clearly Scottish-based companies uh, have struggled as well. I think inclusive growth too, we haven't, I haven't got time to really look on that, but it has been mentioned by a number of members and we really felt jointly that that was really important. So I do thank members for the interest in taking part in this debate this afternoon. The committee will note the points that have been made and we will certainly continue to focus on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Basin. And that concludes our debate on Scotland's economic future and economic data. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. There's one question today. The question is that motion 14824 in the name of Gordon Lindhurst on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee on Scotland's economic future and economic data be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.